let's see. I mean, it, I bet the overall course grades, the the median grade is around eighty five percent or something, and the median quiz score is probably around seventy to seventy five. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but the and then the first one is you know scores lower than later ones because you don't. It's hard to convey what kind of things I'm going to look for until you sort of get a glimpse at it. But um, I think, uh, you know, if you, so there was the one question at the end where you had to do a unit conversion. But the four questions before that, like if you took this and like searched through your notes, you'd find it at one time during class where I said that thing, you know. And so that's kind of what it's going to be, you know, like to do well on the quizzes, you kind of just have to like take the notes and then read the notes later and then skim the notes, you know, like, and I'm trying to, I'm doing that to try to make you keep this stuff fresh in your head. Yes. That's a good question. I think in the, I think it says cumulative in the syllabus, but. It doesn't? You don't think we should? <laughs> I, you know, I'm sort of, I'm okay with doing, because the thing is, like, when I do the assignments, I haven't done it yet, but I'm about to start um, assigning, like, old, like, in the stuff that you're supposed to read for the day. We'll go back to the first class, and I'll ask you to read those. And so the quizzes could still just be on the stuff that we've done in the last week. I think that's reasonable. Let's do that. Okay, it's decided. But that but they'll still be old stuff because I'm still gonna keep making you go back or trying to get you to go back and reread. Yes. The quizzes or the test? The quizzes are yeah, mostly just short answer where I'm just trying to uh, ask if you remember a specific thing that I said in class. And uh, I, uh, I focus on the things, you know, I emphasize the things that I think of as important, you know. So, like, I try not to make it about, like, remembering some little bit of minutia that whatever. But, uh, but anyways, yeah, let's go through the answers to this one and we can rap about it. Yes. Okay, so quiz one. What if we made up a rap about it? That would be weird. That'd be really stupid. Okay. <laughs> um, so what two things need to be chosen before position can be expressed as a number? Um, so that's from uh, when I was introducing the idea of position. And the things that you need to define are a zero position and a positive direction. So before a position can be represented by a number, you need to pick those two things. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, once you choose one, it chooses the other. And yeah, yeah, that's two decisions, but it's not a it's not enough decisions, you know. If you think about it that way, then yeah, right. Then you need to choose three things. You know what I mean? Uh, Are we choosing three or two? Well, yeah, it's the there's only two directions. So once you choose one, the uh, the other one is. Defined. Uh, the word kinematics, the second one, um, kinematics is just describing the motion. Um, with no causes included, so no forces or masses. Um, and 
Number three, uh, what's 1D motion? Uh, so the key thing I was looking for there was just that there are only two options. You could have said, so anybody who mentioned positive and negative, that was good. Anyone who uh, said forward and backwards, that was good. Um, it's just the two different choices. Uh, let's say positive and negative. So at any point, the object can only go in a positive or a negative direction. Um, what's a particle? Uh, so a particle is something, uh, so it's nothing special about the object. Um, it's something that we're treating as having no length dimensions. Um, because it has no length dimensions, um, we can't, there's no way to describe its orientation. Um, but it does have mass. Um, And let me know if you have any questions about any of these. You can't. Uh, that either I misspoke or you wrote it down wrong. Um, but you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yes. So th that's what we're doing with all this particle stuff is we're trying to figure out the location. But we can't, we can't, uh, it doesn't have an orientation. So all we can talk about is tracking like its center of mass or something. Um, and then the last one, unit conversion. Uh, so we had 1050 miles per hour. Um, and then uh, one mile is 1609.344 meters, and one hour is 3,600 seconds. And that comes out to like 469 or something. Um, I, uh, I didn't uh, enforce the scientific notation thing because... Some people didn't have calculators and asked me if it was all right to just show the what you would multiply or whatever, and I said that would be fine. So, um, so they didn't have scientific notation, so I just said forget it for all of them. Uh, any questions about that one? Okay. So yeah, this uh, the quizzes are mostly just my one way of. Uh, trying to make you read and reread your notes, you know. And then also just to try to, when you go through the problems, to try to keep it in your head, you know, how you did it. Any other questions about the quiz? Yeah, so it would be 4.69 whatever times 10 to the 2 meters per second. That's right. It'll just be a problem on the test. Um, and I think exam one is a week from today, right? Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. So exam one is uh, Monday the 18th. And the topics, the kind of problems that are relevant for this are um, units and 1D kinematics. So 
there can be problems that follow the thought processes of either of these two sets of problems. Um, I think hopefully today we'll get through everything that you need for all the rest of the 1D kinematics problems. Um, but if not, we'll, we'll get to it early on Wednesday. Um, All right, so um, the kind of 1D kinematics problems that we've talked about so far uh, have been like ramps and cars braking and speeding up and that kind of thing. Um, but the single biggest, uh, like the reason that constant acceleration problems are important in physics comes from projectile motion and free fall. So now we're going on to free fall, which is a synonym of projectile motion. That's probably not true in our everyday speech, you know, but um, these are the same thing. And what they mean is the only significant force Acting is gravity. Oh, by the way, uh, another synonym for this is ballistic motion. Um, so, like ballistic missiles are missiles that uh, I don't really, I assume, are. <laughs> uh, Ballistic missiles are ones that you don't control with jets or whatever. You shoot them, and then they're just following this projectile motion. Um, and so that also means that like, if you get really mad and you go ballistic, it means you just like slump down to the floor in a pile, you know? Um, So when you're on Earth, what? Yeah, exactly. As as we usually are, um, there is always another force acting. Uh, air resistance is always acting. So air resistance always acts. on any object in motion, any object that's moving. So the question isn't really when is there no air resistance. <clears throat> the question is when is air resistance small enough that it might be reasonable to neglect it in, in the object motion. Um, When is it negligible or, in other words, another way of saying that is uh, when can you get good enough answers by assuming that there's no air resistance? Um, and uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about most of the day, uh, half the class maybe, uh, today is just like, what are the things that affect, uh, what, are the, what are the factors that, that determine how much air resistance affects an object's motion? Okay. That's what the lab this week is about. Um, all right, so here's the first thing, and this is a little weird. It's hard for people to get used to this. Um, so this is a common 
misconceptions. It's very common uh, for people to have this idea that somehow um, gravity on its own uh, makes more massive objects accelerate at a higher rate. Okay, like somehow gravity is, you know, like you take a ball of iron and a feather, you know, and you drop them at the same time. The feather doesn't accelerate very much. It sort of flutters down. The iron ball accelerates really fast and hits the ground moving a lot faster. Um, but that is not, that does not have to do with the mass and the way gravity acts on the mass. Um, and in fact, if there was no air resistance, the feather and the iron ball would fall exactly, they would accelerate exactly the same, they would hit the ground at the exact same time. So that sort of, uh, that, that idea that you have in your head about how more massive objects are more affected by gravity, it's really not gravity. It's really air resist uh, resistance has a smaller effect on the iron ball than it does on the feather. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to show a video. Uh, let me write that. Um, if there was no air resistance, any two objects. Uh, you know, drop from the same height would take the same amount of time to hit the ground. And um, that was, uh, you know, some of the most famous uh, physicists and philosophers and whatever um, who were alive before people, before Newton made sense out of this idea, um, s still had this idea that, uh, that gravity accelerated more massive things more than it did less massive things. So it's not a it's not a simple idea to wrap your head around, you know, like people way smarter than any of us, maybe maybe not you, but everyone else. Um uh <laughs> that's stupid. Um oh okay. Okay. Um still misunderstood this. So this is a misconception that's really easy to make, uh, and I'm going to try to keep hammering on it. Yep. Yes. Commonly misunderstood? That's correct. Yes. Okay. So what we're going to watch is this video where um, they have this gigantic room that they're able to suck the air out of, not pretty close to all of the air out of. They use it for aerospace, uh, you know, like airplane demonstrations and testing and stuff. And once you suck all the air out of the room, there's no air resistance or essentially none. And uh, what they're going to do is, well, first they'll take a bowling ball and a feather before they suck the air out, and they'll drop them both, and you'll see what you expect to see. Um, the bowling ball smashes down to the ground. The feather flutters down slowly. But then they take all the air out of the room. They'll drop the two at the same time, and the two fall identically right next to each other the whole way, and the feather slams into the ground and <laughs> breaks apart and bounces. It's really funny to see because, I mean, it's, it's very against your, your experience with feathers. 
Um, okay. This is NASA's space power facility near Cleveland, Ohio, and it is the world's biggest vacuum chamber. It's used to test spacecraft in the conditions of outer space, and it does that by pumping out the 30 tons of air in this chamber until there are about two grams left. And it's kind of got an eccentric construction, which is part of its history. It was built in the 1960s, as a nuclear test facility to test nuclear propulsion systems. And that meant that they built it out of aluminium to make the radiation easier to deal with. Aluminium is not the best thing, the strongest material to build a vacuum chamber out of. So they built outer concrete skin, which is part radiation shielding and part an external pressure vessel, so that this thing can take the force present on the outside when it's pumped out to the conditions of outer space. Galileo's experiment was simple. He took a heavy object and a light one and dropped them at the same time to see which fell fastest. In this case, the feathers fell to the ground at a slower rate than the bowling ball because of air resistance. So in order to see the true nature of gravity, we have to remove the air. Okay, so first one, the feather falls slow. Was there air in there or no air? Air. What's one way you can know that? He was standing there breathing. That's right. The other is that those two, <laughs> the other thing is that those two objects did not fall with the same acceleration. It takes three hours to pump out the 800,000 cubic feet of air from the chamber. Okay, we dropped two millitor in the last 30 minutes. But once it's complete, there's a near perfect vacuum inside. 6104 manual, 10% open. Station one, go for drop. PCB 30-1. One funny thing about this is, you know, these people who work full time in this thing and have presumably like worked there for years, like they've never, they're testing like space systems and engines and stuff. Like they've never dropped them. And so they, so they look at this and like, they look really like, wow, that's amazing, you know? And you're like, you work here all day, every day, but they've never done this kind of stuff. We are go for drop. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, on, two, one, release. This is slow motion. <laughs> That's not how gravity acts when the, don't get distracted there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly the same. And like they don't even ripple or anything because that's all done by air, you know. Isaac Newton would say that the ball and the feather fall because there's a force pulling them down. Gravity. Okay. But Einstein imagined the scene very differently. Let's skip all the rest. But 
So in the world that we sort of live in in this class, where all of our free fall calculations assume there's no air resistance, you can think like all of our calculations involving free fall are like in that chamber, you know? And so um, for us, if there's an object that isn't being touched by its surroundings, you know, and we're willing to make the free fall approximation saying that air resistance is negligible, um, that object always has an acceleration downward of 9.81 <laughs> meters per second squared. And that's just always the acceleration of something that's free fall. Um, So everything in free fall accelerates down at 9.81 meters per second squared. I like the average because uh, it has to do with mass and distance from the center of the earth and whatever. So that can fluctuate a little bit depending on what kind of geological structures you're near and stuff like that. But at sea level, that's sort of the average. Um, OK, so yes. Not for the, so yeah, later we'll start talking about forces and, you know, gravity applies a force to an object and then we'll see it does matter. But if, if all you're doing is trying to track the motion of an object that's only significant force is applied by gravity, it doesn't matter. Yes. No, you could have, so this would have been actually cooler because they could have, uh, this would have looked even weirder to us. They could have taken the feather at the start and bumped it like this, and it would have spun down like a fidget spinner or whatever, you know, <laughs> the whole way down. Uh, so um, those kind of calculations we will get into at the end of this semester, but that's not... That's dealing with the orientation of the object. And particles, we don't treat the orientation. So that doesn't come up in our treatment yet. Um, but uh, the, the rippling and stuff comes from the air. And so you, like, if you look at those feathers as they go down in slow motion, they're just like perfectly still. You know, There's nothing causing the rippling. Um, by the way, like, you know, there are a lot of people who don't believe people ever landed on the moon. And uh, a lot of, if you go through like the list of all the arguments for how they know that this was staged in like a Hollywood studio, a bunch of the arguments have to do with the motion of the flag on the moon. They say, because like you see this flag in the background and it's sort of rippling, you know, and they say there's no, there's no wind on the moon. So the, flag couldn't ripple. But there's also, wind is one thing that starts things rippling, but it also uh, makes things that are rippling stop or makes their motion change. And if there's no air, the thing just, whatever motion you start it with, it keeps going. So like if on the moon, if you bang a flag down onto the ground, it starts jiggling around and there's nothing to stop it. So it just keeps jiggling, you know? Um, I'm not trying to take a political stance on this one way or the other. <laughs> I, I guess I, uh, I tend to believe that people did land on the moon. Okay, now let's talk about, so what are the things, if there is air resistance, so uh, since we're going to always, the calculations that we do have to assume that there's no air resistance. Um, we kind of have to know when that's a reasonable assumption. 
And so now I'm going to talk about the things that make air resistance affect motion more for one object than another object. Um, like, for example, what, what is it about the bowling ball that makes its motion pretty resistant to air? And the feather is totally influenced by air. The, dens the density of the air or, or of the object? Yep. Uh, so the dense, I'm going to talk about three things. That's two. Right. Um, one is the mass of the object, and that's related to the density. Uh, one is the surface area of the object, basically the size. And then the, the last one is the speed. And those three things all come into play. Uh, there's also something else we'll talk about in lab that has to do with the shape of the object. Some shapes just catch air more than others do. You know, that's why you try to, cars have like a streamlined shape so they don't catch as much air. Um, but I'm just going to talk about these three. And I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to give examples uh, to sort of show intuitively how this works uh, with each of these. So there are three main things. that um, determine the air resistance effect on an object's motion. Um, and those are mass, size, I'm going to think of size as surface area, and speed. Okay, so the first one is mass. Um, and so if everything else is the same between two objects, the mass is different, um, if everything else is equal. Okay, so, uh, so like if you have, if you're dropping a, a steel sphere at the same time that you're dropping a beach ball that's that exact same size and shape, but obviously way less massive, air resistance is going to affect the beach ball thing, the inflated thing, a lot more than it's going to affect that steel ball. And that's just because of the mass. So if everything else is equal, uh, increasing the mass of an object decreases the air resistance effect on its motion. So, as an example, uh, yeah, imagine the thing we just talked about, a, um, a steel sphere is affected much less by air resistance. than a beach ball of the same size. Um, in this room, if you drop the two of them from about this height, they would hit the table at the same time. The uh, free fall approximation would be good for both of them. But if you drop them from much higher than that, uh, the steel ball would still be approximated basically perfectly by assuming no air resistance, and the beach ball would start to hit noticeably later.
than the steel ball. Any questions about that one? Yeah, well, so the air resistance doesn't really go down, but its effect on the motion goes down. Um, so air resistance on the steel ball is still applying just as big a force as it is on the beach ball. But the steel ball is being pulled on by gravity much harder because of its mass. We'll get into that later. But, um, and so that same force, even though that same force is applied to both of those two things, that same force doesn't have much effect on the steel ball. It has a big effect on the beach ball. Any other questions about that? Uh, the second thing is surface area. And with surface area, if everything else is equal, um, decreasing the surface area decreases the effect air resistance has on motion. So as an example of that, imagine like a one of those green army men with the parachutes. And then think of like a marble or something that weighs the same amount. Okay. A marble with the same weight. And the same mass. Um, well, the because of the parachute, the army man is going to fall, you know, is going to accelerate much less. Uh, the whole design of the parachute, getting that huge surface area, is just there to try to um, counteract gravity as much as possible and to keep something from accelerating that's falling. Any questions about that one? So what I'm sort of leaving out there is the fact that um, you could you could have two things that have the same mass and the same surface area, and because one has you know has flat sides that can catch the air, and the other one has uh, like a streamlined shape, they would still have different air resistance effects. But I'm just gonna. I'm just going to talk about surface area, but we'll we'll see that in lab. And then the last one is speed, and um, the effect of air resistance is really dependent on speed. When you see the equation that determines how much air resistance you have, speed is the one variable that's squared in the equation. So, you know. Speed goes from two to four. Uh, the air resistance goes from four to sixteen. You know what I mean because of that square, and so you get a really fast increase in the effect of air resistance as something gets faster. Um, so for speed, as you decrease the speed, you get a reduced effect of air resistance on the motion. Uh, and in the example that I gave where I was talking about the effect of mass, um, and you have the steel ball and the beach ball thing that's the same size, if you drop them both 
down to the table from here, you drop it down a foot or two feet. Uh, they would be done at the same time. You know, so it, you'd have to have a really, really sensitive camera to be able to tell uh, tell them apart, like when they hit the ground. But if you lifted them up a little higher, like say lift them up ten feet and drop them, then you'll see a big difference in the amount of time. And um, so, well, the the more massive thing is going to hit the ground first because it's less affected by air resistance. But the reason that it matters whether you lift it up 10 feet has to do with the speed. If you drop it from here, neither of them get going very fast, and so air resistance is small. If you lift them up higher, they get going faster, and then air resistance uh, becomes important. So the example I like, I think it felt more timely when I used to talk about this in like, 2008 or whatever, like, because everyone used to like bicycle racing when everyone thought Lance Armstrong was cool. But I still like bicycle racing, so I'm still going to use this example. Um, okay, so if you're watching, like, the Tour de France, um, you know, mostly they it's this 2,000-mile race. Um, but most of the races... Going into it, everybody knows they're not going to have any effect on who wins the race. They're, even though they're like 200-mile long races. And the reason people know that it won't have any effect on the overall standings is that if you sit behind somebody, you're doing a lot less work than if you're out there fighting, fighting your way through the wind, you know. And so um, there are really only three... Well, let's, there are two types of races where um, there's any chance to make up time for the overall to, to win the Tour de France overall. Uh, the first one is when they're climbing through the, mount, the mountains, the Alps and the Pyrenees. And uh, the, the second one, the one I want to talk about, are the time trials. And in the time trials, you're just not allowed to, to be next to other people. They let them go like three minutes apart. And they just time you. And uh, you get your time at the end, and they compare your time to the other people. Okay, so you can't, you can't draft behind other people. Okay, so that's the time trials. And that's the most important determinant of who wins the Tour de France. And there's two types of time trials. There are time trials where they go over the flat ground, basically flat. And there are ones where they climb up the mountains in the Alps and the Pyrenees. And so let me draw, so here's a flat time trial. They look sort of like this. Um, they're wearing these like rubberized suits. They're, um, their biking shoes have covers over them that uh, make them, make there just be no like edges between their pants and their shoes. Uh, they're in a position sort of like this. Okay, they have these long like helmets. Okay, so that's a guy in a flat time trial. Okay. So something like that. Like um every every possible thing that you could like stuff that seems so ridiculous you don't know why anyone would ever consider it aerodynamics wise has been taken into account in coming up with what this setup looks like. Um you do their training in wind tunnels for it. The, you know, the cables on your bike that, that convey what you do up here down to the brakes and the shifters and stuff. Um, those are like tiny little uh, rubber wrapped metal, uh, like basically metal cables, you know. Like how much air resistance is that going to cause? But they don't even mess with that. They make sure that those go through the bicycle the whole way. And wherever they come out of the bicycle to be used, they're hidden behind something else that's already 
having to fight through the air. So like just everything's taken into consideration. And then they have these other ones. So this is a mountain time trial. Okay, so you're going up these steep hills. And when they do those, they're, let's see. You'd think I've drawn these pictures enough times that I should remember what I'm, what my plan is. Uh, so they basically, they don't look that different than when you just go out for a bike ride. Um, I mean, they're on super light, expensive bikes. But they're just wearing their regular helmets, or else they might just be wearing little cycling caps. Um, they have their hands up on the top of the bars. They're not even worried about like bending over to be more aerodynamic. Um, Instead of having like the rubberized suits, they just have on regular cycling jerseys. And most of the time they'll have those unzipped all the way down. Like everything's catching air. They're not worried about the cables showing on their bikes. And um, the difference between those two, so like when they're in a flat time trial, their number one concern is aerodynamics. And when they're in a mountain time trial, it's almost not a concern at all. And that entire difference from being the most important thing to not being important at all just comes from the fact that here they're going 35 miles an hour. And here they're going maybe 15, maybe possibly up to 20 miles an hour. That doesn't seem, you know, like, it doesn't seem like that would be the kind of difference that would make aerodynamics this night and day factor. You know what I mean? But that speed change makes that kind of difference because of the fact that speed is squared in this uh, in this equation that determines the air resistance effect. I'll give it to you in lab. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna change everything for you, I think. Um, Well, they just, since they're going up a mountain, they can't go fast enough for aerodynamics to be as important, you know, because biking up a hill is hard, you know. And so, and so the fastest they ever go is 20 miles an hour, and that's just not, 35 mi miles an hour is enough to make it a totally, like, determining factor, but 15 or 20 isn't enough for that. Uh, they, um, I don't know if they, I don't know if they do altitude changes that are that big a difference, but yeah, I mean, you're just basically like trying to be comfortable and, and, you know, put your body in a position where you can generate a lot of power for a long time. Uh, whereas in the flat time trial, like you're trying to generate power, but you would never change your aerodynamic position to try to increase it. You know, like those guys in their rubberized suits, believe this, they are really hot. They would love to unzip their suits a little, you know, but having the zipper down would make a big effect in their time. Yep. Yes, I have. That's so cool. Yeah. I just saw that like a month ago. Yeah, there's there's this group of like four people coming down a mountain together. And uh, they're all like three of the guys are just getting down low, pedaling, you know. And the fourth guy, like, as he's riding 60 miles an hour, so I don't know how safe it is, but he, like, gets off his seat and lies down so his chest is on his seat. And then he and sticks his legs straight out behind him, which you can imagine is a lot more aerodynamic than sitting on your seat like this. And they're pedaling as hard as they can, and he just goes, like, by them so fast. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll do that Wednesday.
Um, okay, and there's one last thing that I want to say before we start getting into problems. Um, so what I said here was uh, everything in free fall, and remember free fall is the same thing as projectile motion, is the same thing as ballistic motion, uh, accelerates down at 9.81 meters per second squared. So that means if you throw an object up into the air, its acceleration is, when the incident leaves your hand, even though it's going up, its acceleration is down at 9.81 meters per second squared. And when it gets to the highest point up there, acceleration is down at 9.81 meters per second squared. And then on its way down, same thing. It's still downward acceleration of 9.81. And I think I said this exact same thing before, but I, I just want to stress like how to make sense out of this for yourself. So um, if you throw an object up into the air, when it's on the way up, is it speeding up or slowing down? Slowing down. And is its velocity up or down? Velocity is the direction that it's moving, so it's up. Okay, so its velocity is up. And if it's slowing down, acceleration has to be down. Um, remember, that's what I said about like how the sign of the acceleration relates to whether something's speeding up or slowing down. If velocity and acceleration are in the same direction, then it's speeding up. If they're in opposite directions, it's slowing down. So then once it gets to the highest point and starts coming down, is it speeding up or slowing down? Speeding up, is its velocity up or down? Down, and so what's its acceleration direction? Down, yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those are good ones. <laughs> yeah. Pretty quizzy. I think I had quizzier ones yesterday or uh, Wednesday, but. <laughs> so when we do these free fall problems, um, uh, when we do these free fall problems, so you always know one of those. So remember, uh, here are the variables that you're trying to figure out if you know or want. Time final, position initial, position final, velocity initial, velocity final, and acceleration. If you have a free fall problem, you always know the acceleration. Okay, that's new. Like, that's not the case when we're talking about problems with a car braking or uh, a ball rolling up or down a hill. But if the only significant force acting on it is gravity, it's not touching anything, uh, and there's no significant air resistance, then you always know that A. Yes. Okay, so let's do an example problem. Um, so let's say the ball is thrown straight up, uh, at a speed of 10 meters per second from a height of three meters. And we want to know a couple things. First, what's the ball's maximum height? So what's the greatest height that it gets to before it starts coming back down? And then second, what's the ball's velocity the instant before it hits the ground?
Okay, so for part A, uh, we're going to, this is a constant acceleration problem, so we're going to use the same approach as before. Um, now we know the acceleration, though. Uh, so time equals zero, if I choose that, choose time final, choose position equals zero, and choose the positive direction. Um, Okay, so time equals zero. Uh, what do we want to choose for time equals zero? The first place, the first instant in this motion where we either have information or want information. What? Yeah, it leaves a hand, right? So in that instant, we can figure out the velocity. We can figure out the position. Okay. And then time final, what's that going to be? That's right. So we want that to be when it gets to the highest point. And yeah, it's true that when it gets to the highest point, so think about what the velocity is doing as the object goes up and slows down. Like it starts out up with the biggest value. And uh, it gets slower and slower and slower until finally, before the velocity switches signs, goes the other direction, we have this instant where the ball has zero velocity. Okay, so when it reaches the highest point, the velocity is going to be equal to zero. And then zero position, I'm going to make that on the ground. The release point. And uh, the positive direction, I'm in free fall problems, I'm always going to make positive up. Um, I think it just keeps you from making mistakes if you just always do the same thing, you know. So there's nothing special about positive being up. That's what I'm going to do. So that's what I hope you're going to do because it makes it easier for me to grade. So now that we've chosen these things, we can think about what variables we know and what variable we want. Um, okay, so do we know time final? Do, do we know the elapsed time between when it's released and when it gets to the highest point? That's not given. If we can get by without answering that, that would be okay. So we'll just leave time final off. What about the initial position? Do we know the position when time is equal to zero? Yeah, positive three. Uh, do we know the position at time final? The velocity is zero, but we don't know the position. That's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find how high it's going to go. And then, yeah, do we know the, the velocity at time equals zero? At time equals zero. Well, we're given the speed. Yep. So we're given the speed is 10 meters per second, and we know it's up, so it's going to be positive 10. So VI is positive 10 meters per second. Do we know the velocity when at TF? Zero, yep. And that's always the case when something's at its highest point in a projectile motion. Yes? Yeah, the sign of the velocity is the direction it's going. So if the ball's going up and your positive is up, then it's going to have a positive sign. If it's going down and your uh, positive direction's up, it's going to have a negative sign. Uh, and then the last one is acceleration, and we always know that. Um, our positive direction is up, so the acceleration is negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Any questions? 
Yes, because um, our positive direction is up and acceleration is down, and so it has to be negative. Yep. All right, so is there an equation that works with these? Uh, I think it's going to have to be this one, 2A times the quantity PF minus P initial is equal to VF squared minus V initial squared. So we have 2 times negative 9.81 meters per second squared times the quantity uh, PF, we don't know what that is, we're trying to find it, minus PI, which is 3 meters, and that's equal to VF squared is, you know, 0 squared. VI is positive 10 meters per second squared. Yep. No. All the F's correspond to time final. And all the I's correspond to time zero. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to have to distribute this stuff through. So um, we have negative uh, 19.62 meters per second squared times PF. And then... Uh, we have positive 2 times 3 meters is 6 meters times negative 9.81 is uh, positive 58.86, I think. Uh, and then the units, uh, we're multiplying the meters times meters divided by seconds squared. Um, that's 6 meters times negative 9.81, or negative 6 meters times negative 9.81. And that's equal to 0 squared minus, so if you square 10 meters squared, you get 100 meters squared per second squared. Now we can subtract 58.86 from both sides. So we have negative 19.62 meters per second squared times PF is equal to negative 158.86 meters squared per second squared. And then divide both sides by negative 19.62 meters per second squared. So you get PF is equal to negative 158.86 meters times meters divided by seconds times seconds. And then we'll divide that by negative 19.62 meters per second squared. So in the denominator, we have negative 19.62 meters. And in the numerator, we have seconds times seconds. Uh, one of the meters cancels, all the seconds cancel. And so we're gonna get units of meters, which is good, because this is a position. Uh, and this gives the final value of 8.10 meters, which is higher than the starting position, so that's good. Does that include the initial value of the adamant? Yep, that includes it because we were using it as our initial position here. The variables? The meaning of them or how we figured them out? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so for uh, for initial position, 
um, we wanted the position when time was equal to zero. And time is equal to zero, uh, you know, we chose our time equals zero to be when the ball starts being launched. So it says in the problem statement that, um, that when the ball is launched, it has a speed of 10 meters per second. So we know that the speed at that instant is 10 meters per second. And then we just have to figure out the sign. And um, since it starts at that instant, it's moving up. And we chose our positive direction up. We know that it has to be positive 10. Um, then the initial, oh, that was, that was, that was the explanation for the initial velocity. Uh, the initial position, we know that we're told that it's three meters off the ground. Our zero position is the ground, and our positive direction is up. So it's three meters in the positive direction from zero, which means it's a value of positive three. Uh, the final velocity, anytime you're looking for an object at the highest point, like it's going up and then reaching a highest point, you're looking for the place where the velocity is zero. And then the acceleration, if we choose a positive direction up, we're always going to have, in free fall, an acceleration of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. That's right. And I would recommend that you just always choose it up so that the stuff looks more similar from problem to problem. Yeah, if you chose it down, all that would be backwards and it's not wrong at all, you know. You wanna do it? No. <laughs> I want, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I just wanna choose positive down. Okay. Um, okay, so part B now, we wanna find the velocity at the instant before it hits the ground. Um, so is there any reason to change our time equals zero instant or our time final instant? We've always said no before, but this time we're going to have to because we're going to, right, we're going to have to change our time final to correspond to that instant right before it hits the ground. Uh, because the only way you can solve for variables is if that variable is occurring at time equals zero or time final. Okay, so we're going to have our time equals zero. We can still have that at the instant it's launched. If you wanted, you could also change this to be when it's at the highest point, and you could, you could still do this problem, but I'm going to just... Everything that I don't have to change, I'm going to keep the same. Uh, time final is when it hits the ground, or it really right before it hits the ground. And then position equals zero and positive direction. I'm going to keep those the same. Okay, well, we didn't change p equals zero or the positive direction, and we didn't change our time equals zero. So that means uh, our initial position and initial velocity are going to stay the same. So we knew those before, we still know them. So p initial is three meters. V initial is positive 10 meters per second. Uh, Do we know position final? Yeah, what's that going to be? Uh, that was, so our position final was 8.10 when our time final was the ball reaching its highest point. But now it's when the ball hits the ground. What? So... The ground, we've defined the ground as our zero position. And so our P final is going to be zero. Yeah, um, if, if you wanted to be, this is what 
you're going to do in this class and and for any like tests related to this material if you ever wanted to be like more careful about it you'd have to figure out uh you'd have to figure out the radius of the ball you know and you'd have to know that it hits the ground this this far before the center gets to the ground you know okay and do we know the final velocity no that's what we want Acceleration, we always know. Oh, and I forgot about time final. Do we know time final, how long it takes to hit the ground? We still don't know that. Okay, so is there an equation that'll let us uh, work with these? I think we can still do this one. So 2a times the quantity pf minus pi is equal to vf squared minus vi squared. So we have 2 times negative 9.81 meters per second squared. times the quantity uh, p final is zero, minus p initial is three meters, and that's equal to v final squared minus v initial squared, so minus, nope, initial. So this should be 10 meters per second squared. Um, so if you multiply all this together, you get negative 58.86 meters squared per second squared is equal to VF squared minus 100 meters squared per second squared. And this should be positive. There's a double negative in that multiplication. Okay, so what we get, switch the sides on these. Uh, we get V final squared is equal to 158.86 meters squared per second squared. And so we can just take the square root and we get VF is equal to It's about 12.6. You also have to take the square root of the units. So it's 12.6 meters per second. And then I'm missing one thing. Uh, if you take the square root, plus or minus, and now that, so that gives us two answers, but we don't want two answers. We need to figure out which one of these makes sense. So what do we want? V final positive or V final negative? Negative. Our positive direction is up, and right before it hits the ground, it's moving down, so that has to be a negative 12.6. And by the way, uh, this is the last thing I'll say, but if you graph this motion, it would look something like this. Um, Time here, position here. Uh, we know it would start at three meters and reach a highest point of 8.10 meters. And so negative 12.6 is the slope of a tangent to that graph at the right edge where it gets to zero position. Anybody want me to say that again? You got that? Don't care? Yeah. So remember, um, the, the instantaneous velocity 
is the slope of the tangent at the point you're looking at to the position versus time graph. So negative 12.6 is the slope of this line. Okay. And what about the positive 12.6? The one that doesn't make any physical sense to us, but it's a real mathematical solution. So what does that represent? What? Yeah, so if I continued this parabola into negative times, that would be the slope of Other questions? Okay, that's all. Go Vikings.